there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in the study that we started last week in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, no, and the, Ephesians. the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesians. And I, I do want to make a comment before we start, and that's, that this is intended to be an in-depth study of God's Word, mm -hmm. not just a, a quick look at this particular letter. It's not an overlook. Because Scripture interprets Scripture, mm -hmm. and we need to learn all of the Scripture. So we use this as an opportunity to see where Scriptures will take us as we go through the letter to the Ephesians. So we'll be going into lots of other books. Well, we do, as you, as you know. I mean, I've had people comment and say, gosh, you know, why are there so many scripture verses? Because it's a Bible study. <laughs> That's right. It's not an opinion study. Right. And the less opinion or me or Alice or Mark that can show up in this, and the more of the Word of God can show up in this, the more profitable it's going to be for all of us. And more powerful. So just bear that in mind. Right. Uh, if you have questions and comments, we welcome you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to communicate with you. Yes, we would. And pray, if you're blessed by these studies, that you would share them with others or make others aware of them. All right? We, we do this because it's been a calling in my life for 43 years, actually. Wow. So, all right. We started last week was our first part in the letter to the Ephesians. Yes. So we're going to pick up now. We've, we got up to verse 3, all the way to verse 3 last week, which is zooming right along. Yippee! Yeah. <laughs> uh, it went very fast. We we want to be done before he gets back? No. That's, I, I, okay. It's, right, over it's, it's, over. it's over when it's over. Hallelujah. So we're going to be picking up, uh, as I said, we got up to verse 3 last week, and we're going to start in Ephesians 1-4 today. But we're going to do that right at the mark, ask for God's blessing on our time together today. Oh, Lord, you say where two or three people are gathered in your name, you're with them also. So, Lord, we just thank you for be, being here, and we thank you for your word. Just open it up to us so we can see its beauty. Amen. Yes. Yeah, we thank you for being in our midst, Lord God. Amen. All right. Well, we left off last week, as I said, in verse 3, in the first first chapter. We were talking about the God, our Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. But he goes on in verse 4 and says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, can I ask a question right there? Speak up. My, it says um, in my version, there's a period after him, and then in love starts the next verse. Okay. And there were some other versions that didn't have, that had the period, and there was other versions that didn't. One of the things you need to understand is that in the Greek, in the original Greek in which the New Testament was written in, and it's also true of the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. There are no punctuations. Right. Right? So it's a matter of the people that are translating this, how they lay it out. Mm -hmm. All right? But I trust that the Spirit of God will give us insight into it. Okay. But, but bear that in mind, okay? That uh, we're not reading the or original Bible. The original right. Bible, the New Testament, it was written in Greek. The Old Testament in Hebrew, as they said. And that's why it's so important to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Not just to see what it says here, but to see how it's translated in other parts of the Bible mm -hmm. or how God is using it. The simple fact of the matter is that the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said, was sent to lead us into all truth. Mm -hmm. So it's the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, inside of me, inside of you, inside of you as we go on, that will bring the truth of what's being said to you. Mm -hmm. All right, so is that satisfactory? Yeah. All right. So it says, 
just as he chose us in him. All right. Mm -hmm. He chose us. Right. Remember, Jesus Christ said, and this is a clear statement in John, the Gospel of John in 15, 16. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose, chose you. Yes. All right. He's talking about he's, he's talking to the disciples and he said, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give you. So he's saying very clearly, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Mm -hmm. Well, this brings us into a place of some great. I don't want I, the word difficulty is troubling to me, but for hundreds and hundreds of years. There has been a great debate, and it's typically called Calvinism versus Arminianism, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with those terms, but it's basically about free will and the choice. You know, did you choose God or did God choose you? Did you find God? You certainly didn't find him, yeah. because the scripture says clearly that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The question becomes, did you have a choice about being saved? Because the Calvinists basically say, no, you did not. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was preordained that you would be saved. You didn't have a choice in it. Whereas in, our, in our Arminianism, they're saying, well, of course, you, you chose to accept his love. Mm -hmm. right?" Mm -hmm. I, I want to say this, and you pray about this. Neither one of them can be right. Mm -hmm. Now, bear in mind that the, it says Peter wrote and said that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness in the scripture, in his, in his word. When people who love the Lord, and I trust that, you know, many of these people, they, they love the Lord. Yes. But they disagree on, on what's going on here. Now, I, ha I think that the answer has to lie somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the very fact that they're in disagreement should show you that the scripture isn't clear enough on it for you to know. Right. All right. These are people, I mean, for hundreds of years, people who truly, truly love the, the Lord on both sides of this disagree with each other. To this day. <laughs> Absolutely to this day. As a matter of fact, you know, Alice and I were over in England and we were there for a couple of months ministering around England. And we sat with two dear brothers, older brothers, who are two of the most mature Christians I know, two of the most powerful preachers I know. And, and very I, much. Very knowledgeable about the Word of God. Yes, Absolutely very, very knowledgeable about the Word of God. And as we sit there and have fellowship, they got into a disagreement about this very thing. And, you know, I, I just wanted to smack them both. But I, but I love them both. But it's like, you know, the, the answer has to lie somewhere in a lack of understanding, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't believe, like the Calvinists do, that it's preordained that you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. But I do know clearly from Scripture that God foreknew what we would choose. What we would choose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't get hung up on this mm -hmm. issue, but do know this because this is really important. Jesus Christ did choose you. Yes. Okay. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. How much part did your choice play in that? It's got to play some part in it because there's too many places in Scripture where God commands us to make a choice. I mean, as the people of God were being the people of God and coming out of captivity in Egypt for the first time, one of the most important statements, I mean, in Deuteronomy, it talks about, I said before you life and death, choose life. He said to Joshua, you know, or Joshua spoke and said, choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So somewhere in there, you have to choose to obey God and receive his word. Absolutely. But you couldn't even do that were it not for the abundant grace of God mm -hmm. at work in you. So just don't get hung up on it, right? That's what I want to say about this great debate between Calvinism and Arminianism is this. And you might want to write this down. Mm -hmm. Blah! <laughs> and it was from before the foundations of the earth. Okay, this is really important. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and he was speaking to the people of God to say this. That he chose us before the foundation. Right? Is that what you're saying? That's what it says here. Yeah, right. Yes, he chose us before the foundations of the world, right? Or, yes. 
Okay. So if he chose us before the foundations of the world, it wasn't because you said anything, because you weren't even well, in existence. Yeah, exactly. Other than the fact that God spoke to Jeremiah, which I was just going to say, in Jeremiah 29 11, he said, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. One of the greatest promises in, in the Word of God is found in Romans 8, where, where Paul wrote and said that for God, whom God foreknew, he predestined to become conformed into the image of his son, Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. But the very fact that he foreknew your, your choice, right? right? He predestined you to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. So that's one of those places where it's showing, right? But he knew you, you know, when did he start to know you? When did he start to know you? On the day you got saved? Yes, the day you got born? He formed us in our mother's yeah. womb. So before you, at the moment of conception, mm -hmm. and listen to this now, at the moment of conception, God was at work, both the will and to work for his good pleasure in your life. Yes. And if you don't believe that's true, then you can write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and explain how John the Baptist could have been filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit. while he was yet in his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he also said to Jeremiah, he went on in, in Jeremiah 1 5, and he said, Before I formed you in the mother, in your mm -hmm. womb. So before, you know, I, I use the example, he was at work. As we were, he, we were being formed in our mother's womb, but he said, before I formed you in the womb, yeah. I knew you. Mm -hmm. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's what he said to Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. But God is no respecter of persons. He was at work. I promise you, I know, and I'll talk about this in time permitting, that he was at work in my life while I was yet in my mother's womb, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So, and David, who in God's wonderful plan was a shepherd for his father, right? That's mm -hmm. when, yes, he was. So when Samuel went out to, to the house of David, or to the house of Jesse, David was out tending his father's flock. Mm -hmm. But God had called him to be a shepherd Sorry. for his flock. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. Think about it. And David said... For you formed me, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Psalm 139, that's verses 13 to 15. So, I mean, if you call yourself a Bible believer, you better believe these, these verses. That God, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. God knew you. And he was at work in you from the moment you were conceived. He was shaping your life, all right? When I got saved, I got saved on my 33rd birthday. That was in 1976. Calculator, calculator. Following the initial overwhelming joy that I was feeling from salvation, hallelujah, I was also, I also quickly began to feel deep remorse. Mm -hmm. And that deep remorse came from the fact that I was 33 years old, and all of those years prior to that, they'd gone by without me really knowing God and Jesus. You thought they were wasted years. So I did. I, I mean, I thought those were wasted years. Mm -hmm. And that, that pained me. And I said that to the Lord, and he spoke to my heart and said, but I have always known you, and I have always been there with you. And he walked me through time after time after time when he had intervened in my life, my unsaved life, actually even my unfleshly life because in my mother's womb, right? He had always been working his plan and his purpose delivering me, showing me that by my testimony, my testimony began before I'd ever, ever even drawn breath. I mean, I've preached this and I've shared this so many times. 
You know, I want to share my testimony. I'll start my testimony where it begins. I was born mm -hmm. because that itself was a miracle. Right. And I was born in 1943 and the doctors wanted to abort me because my mother was having complications with the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was a live human being. My heart was beating inside my mother's womb. I was a live human being and God was molding and shaping. Me. And they wanted to kill me. Well, God intervened. And, well, obviously, here I am. But my mother was saved. I mean, she went through and was fine. <laughs> the Holy Spirit led me to this prophetic word. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Joel, Joel 2.25. So I was saying, you know, it's like all that's been gone. It's been destroyed. All that, those 33 years of life were, were gone and never profited. And God said, no, no. He said, I knew you. I was at work in your life. And he restored to me those years that were eaten. The Lord gave me back and restored those many years that I thought I'd lost to the enemy. And that's what he does for each and every one of us. And my joy was made complete. Yes. Hallelujah. All right. So trust me on this. No, don't trust me. Trust God, because this word makes it so. <clears throat> that he was at work in you, working when you were in your mother's womb. He had his hand on you. Your relationship with God didn't start when you said, yes, Lord. Your relationship with God started when he said, I'm, I'm building that life. Okay. And if, and if anybody hasn't. Ask the Lord, because it's, it does say in Scripture, forgetting what lies behind, press on towards mm -hmm. the goal. But if you wanted to find out where God was in your life back in those years, that's the only thing you should look behind for. Huh. And ask the Lord to show you, and he will. Because that's, there are things that happen outside of time and space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Einstein probably had the best grasp on uh Relativity. Well, relativity in time, but he didn't have a clue. Right. Right. To the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. I don't think he ever figured that one out. Okay. The thing is, if if he was writing your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, what year was that? <laughs> From before the foundations of the earth. If time is measured by how many, how fast the earth goes around the sun, and there was no earth, and there was no sun. He was working on you before time was created, created. all right? That's right. That'll, that'll work your brain. All right, so it goes on in verse 5 to say, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. He predestined us. That's a, that's understand that, right? Right, right? He knew ahead of time. He, he predestined us. Exactly. His plan all along was about his family. Mm -hmm. Christianity, what we call Christianity, is first and foremost a family affair. Yes. All right? Paul wrote in Romans 8, verses 14 and 16, he said, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Mm -hmm. You and I were not predestined to become Catholics or Baptists or Lutherans or Pentecostals or Presbyterians or Anglicans or Church of England and on and on and on ad nauseum, right? Mm. That's not what you're predestined to. Mm -mm. The command, not the suggestion, is that there be no division among us. We are the children of God. And yet, the World Christian Encyclopedia, which is the most, or the most accepted book on listening churches and the definition of denominations, they still list tens of thousands of denominations in the Christian faith. Hmm. Now, denomination comes from the Latin, de nominere, to call, call by name. What name do you want to be called by? And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved other than Jesus. Acts 4.12. 
There's only one name that I want to be called by, by Jesus. And, and this is something that we've lost sight of because of our culture. Alice and I were married, let's see, as, as we were filming now, we were married 52 years and two months ago. Mm -hmm. It was a different time in a different culture. Way different. <laughs> when I married Miss Besanda, Alice over there, she became Mrs. Alan McDaniel. That's the way she was called. That's the way it was fifty yeah. half a century ago. That's correct. Then it changed where people they wanted that women wanted to have more of their own identity. So no, it's not Mrs. Alan McDaniel, it's Mrs. Alice McDaniel. Well, I can live with that, but I mean but it's a, it's a it's, it's an a important change. Disconnect. It's, it's a disconnection. Yes. Right? And then we come to the place and the first I mean that I saw it and totally took note of it was with uh, Clinton. Mrs. Bill Clinton, who called herself Hillary Rodham Clinton and kept her maiden name. Mm -hmm. She weren't she didn't want to lose that. I want to be lost in Christ. And that's where we should be lost in. I I, I do. I, I want to, all right? So I, I'm married to Christ. Whoa. That's right. I'm part of the bride of Christ. That's right. We should be called by his name. Mm -hmm. It's not a denominational name, right? For this reason, it says in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him, talking about Jesus, the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. <clears throat> One more time, let me read this. Yeah. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, so much for the debates, mm -hmm. and that there be no divisions among you but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10. That's unity. Let me tell you something. If we are not of the same mind, we are certainly not complete. As iron sharpens iron, so one man another. Two are better than one for the labor. And Paul, as he, Paul would write to the church of the Galatians and say, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28. Well, are we one in Christ Jesus? It certainly isn't evident by looking around. Perhaps it's time. Just think about this. Consider this. Pray about it. Perhaps it's time to repent of our denominations rather than boasting in them. Absolutely. All right, zipping right along, I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. We have redemption through his blood. Right? Shedding of blood had to be. Let's sing a quick chorus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing but, but the, the blood, blood of Jesus. Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing, Nothing but, but the blood, blood of Jesus. Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, of the fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Didn't sing it well. That's okay. But but that's a beautiful hymn. It's yes, nothing it but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. However, then let's consider this. Isaiah came into the heavenly temple of God, in the presence of God, who was sitting on his throne, lofty and exalted, while the train of his robe filled the temple. You know where I am? There were seraphim hovering around the throne, crying out with a heaven-shaking voice, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it's written in Isaiah chapter 6. He said, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, for I live among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal, a live coal, it says in King James. Live coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with that live coal. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Isaiah 6, mm. verses 5 through 7. So and that there. Explanation. Well, I thought it was nothing but the blood. <laughs> um, on the surface, there's a problem. Okay, but that's what it's saying. I mean, it's saying. Yes. So, but this is why we have to be willing to go before God and seek Him through His Holy Spirit because the answer is always there. Yes. And God is consistent. Yes. He is persistent and He is consistent. All right? Isaiah's sin was forgiven by a live coal. But interestingly, in the Hebrew, mm -hmm. and this, I mean, this is what's pull out your little concordance yeah. and go study this. In the Hebrew, that word for coal there is literally ritzba, which means pavement. That's what it means in Hebrew, pavement. Why didn't they put, hey, he, why, when they translated it, why didn't they put pavement? Because they didn't understand it. But that's what it says. Doesn't matter if you understand it. Right. Put what it says. The coal was a living prophetic symbol of what was to come. Not the coal, the pavement. It says in John 19, 13, Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha, John 19, 13, he judged Jesus while he sat at a place called the pavement. He was judged, Jesus was judged, found not guilty, and then sentenced to death at a place called the pavement, and then handed over to be crucified. The truth of the word will always point to the word of the cross. Okay? It was about, it took it right to the place where Jesus was judged and crucified. Think about the words of Paul when he said, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 and 2. It's always about the word of the cross, something that is not being preached very frequently in the churches around us today. The fear of the Lord and the word of the cross. The shed blood of Jesus, the shed Christ. Blood of Jesus Christ. Judged for us. Judged and found not guilty and sentenced to death because we were deserving of death. Yes. The wages of sin is death. And he went to that cross and paid the price for us. We have to understand that. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things I don't understand is, and I, I talked about time, time being relative. We're out of it again. It just zips along. It's just going. We, we try and stay as close as we can to a half an hour. And, uh, because if it were up to me, uh, we would do five and six hour studies. <laughs> but I don't know that you'd put up with that. All right. So we're going to leave off here in this verse and come back and start next week right here. In the midst of it now. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would quicken your word to us. It's a living word. It's a word that not only is living, but it brings life. So we pray, Lord God, that your word would go into us, that you would give us a greater and greater understanding of it, and that we would indeed be led by your word, because Jesus Christ who is your Son, our Lord, our Savior, is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. 
And I ask that in his name, Father. All right, well, until next week, please write to us. Feel free to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Pray for us. And if you have prayer requests, if you have prayer needs, write to us, and we'll pray for you. Amen. All right? So Amen. until next week, next time, may the Lord our God bless you, bless you, bless you. Hallelujah. For the glory of his name. Amen, amen and amen. Bye now. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.